Um, I was reflecting earlier uh, on, I, I've been coming to Linux Conf AU since 2008 and I've been reflecting on things that have changed a bit since, uh, since that conference in the open source world and one of the things I don't think I would have ever imagined back then was actual .NET running on Linux. Um, I'm reliably informed that that is now actually a thing. And uh, our next presenter, Alistair Chapman, is going to tell us about how that's a thing and how it works and how you can use .NET on Linux. Please make him welcome. All right, thank you everyone for coming to what is potentially the most contentious topic on the schedule. Um, I want to start off by saying that I am going to be going very fast and I have a lot of content to get through, so you will have to leave the pitchforks and torches until I make it to the hallway. Now, before we get too far, who am I? My name is Alistair Chapman. Um, I'm AGC 93, basically everywhere else. I am a .NET MVP and work in information security at Red Hat. This whole talk is me and me alone. If you, don't, if you disagree with me, that's fine. Just don't take it up with my boss. So, what are we covering today is the wonderful world of .NET on Linux. As has already been pointed out, it's the topic no one expected to see at an actual Linux conference, and even a few years ago, everyone thought it was a bit of a bonkers idea. But thankfully, we have it now, and this is what we're going to be trying to burn through as much of this as we can in the fairly short time we have today. So this is basically the next 25 minutes, is me pretending to know all these things about platforms that are realistically only quite new. So a lot of these are moving targets, and they'll change quite a bit. But first, let's look at how we got to today. .NET on Linux is not exactly something we expected to see in the state it is today, and certainly not Microsoft-supported .NET on Linux, which is where we are. And the Linux community traditionally has been fairly hostile towards .NET, and that is not entirely their fault. Um, so we're going to have a quick check at whether it is just expert hating on languages you don't use, or whether there's a real reason for why that might be the case. Now let's start with a quick look at the history of .NET. This will be fairly quick because we don't have too much time. Way back in 2000, we have the .NET framework being announced, and then the first ECMA standards released based on .NET. And Microsoft's full of talk about how open and standardized this is going to be. And as it turns out, Microsoft is full of talk and not much else at that point. Very shortly after that, we get both at almost the same time, only a couple of days apart, the Mono project and the .GNU project, two Linux-based projects to recreate the .NET ecosystem on Linux. Uh, Mono, obviously, we now know is still going. .gnu, not so much. Now, those projects were announced around O'Reilly OSCon of those years and were based on the very initial standards of the .NET framework. It didn't go 1.0 until 2002, and then came this fun one, Rota. Now, Rota was Microsoft's attempt to sucker up to the open source communities. So they released a big chunk of .NET and said, it's all yours, go mad, just sign this really complicated license agreement, also you can't use it in commercial applications and it's only for research purposes, and we're hiding a big chunk of it behind some paywalls and also you can't see all of it. But it's open source. The Linux community were not too thrilled with that, nor open source generally, and so it sort of got left in a bit of a weird little limbo for quite some time. Now, the Mono project in this time was getting cracking and released 1.0 a measly three years later, shortly after the 0.1 release of the only functioning IDE on Linux at the time. So things were obviously cracking along at an absolutely blistering pace. By the time Mono had gone 1.0, .NET Framework 2 was already around the corner, and so then came Rota 2.0, which Microsoft reaffirmed their commitment to open source and how good it was going to be, and Rota was going to be the greatest. It's going to be all open source, which is why that was the last release that was ever made, and it was killed shortly afterwards. Microsoft's policy on this was pretty clear. Portable.NET, which was the result of that .gnu project, made it all the way to 2007 and a ripping 0.8 release, which was barely functional, before it, that was the last release ever made. Um, there was no announcement of its death, it just sort of disappeared. Mono, obviously, Mono Develop went 1.0, uh, and amazingly is around to this day, and Mono 2.0 went there again. Now we're only two and a half years behind .NET framework, so still keeping up that blistering pace. This one I won't get into too much because it is quite a messy topic, but our Lord and Saviour Richard Stallman went online and blogged at length about how basically using Mono was like inviting the devil into your home and how Microsoft was out to get you all with the wonders of software patents. Some of the points were quite true, some of them were pretty bonkers. And everyone sort of cooled down a lot on Mono after that. There was a, a big controversy with Ubuntu packaging Banshee, which was based on Mono at the time, and then it got yanked again afterwards. Through all of this, uh, Miguel de Casa, who was relatively well known, um, got through some very bizarre dealings with Novell and a bunch of other people, and we got Xamarin Inc. only a few years later. This is mostly important because quite a few years later, we finally made it to Mono 4, 
and Mono 4 arrived almost in time for .NET to be completely rewritten. Now, it's worth noting as well that Mono 4 at this point was still almost two years behind .NET Framework. So Mono 4 comes out, Mono gets relicensed after its acquisition by Microsoft, which caught a lot of people by surprise, and then we have .NET Core 1.0. Now, this was Microsoft coming out and saying, here is our new version of .NET. It's much leaner, it's faster, it's great, and also, surprise, it runs on a bunch of different platforms and it's completely open source, at which point everyone went, hang on, this isn't April, why are we talking about this? And it turns out they weren't lying. They actually did make an open source cross-platform version of .NET, which was a nice touch for everyone. They weren't too good at it, which is why about six months later we got what I like to call the .NET Core 1.what-the-fuck release because it was released today uh, together on the same day they released the SDK 1.0.4, the runtime 1.1.2, the tools 0.6.0 preview 2, and Visual Studio 15.3. So obviously that makes sense. A few months later, we got Mono 5 and Mono 5.2. Now, these are mostly important because you'll note that previously there were several years between Mono releases, and here they are barely a year and a half apart. And Mono 5.2, Mono, sorry, Mono 4 was the very first one to include any Microsoft open source code, and Mono 5 was the first one to completely implement a Microsoft spec, and that was .NET Core 1.6. Mono 5.2 is quite interesting because that was the implementation of the new 2.0 standard and most impressive because that means they actually released a Linux version of .NET Core 2, .NET Standard 2.0 before Microsoft did. A couple of days later came the main .NET Core 2.0. Now the point of all this, other than a fun trip through memory lane, is that you'll notice there's several years and a whole lot of hostility going on through this last decade there and then suddenly we get to the last few years and everyone's suddenly very chummy and everything moves very, very fast. This was mostly important for the Mono project as we'll get to. Second, so we've covered that. This is the very first result you get from Googling Mono project. The first suggestion is that it's dead. Now you'll note from that timeline that's pretty ridiculous. It's never moved faster, it's never had more code, it's never had more contributors and has the complete backing of one of the world's largest technology company, companies. Unfortunately, that particular rumor is one that simply refuses to die. The main problem is everyone misunderstanding that. Microsoft came out and announced .NET Core as this lean, fast, cross-platform runtime for .NET. What they didn't announce was that .NET Framework was dying, because it wasn't. Mono has always been a re-implementation of the complete .NET Framework, with 20 years of craft. You want built-in XML serialization? Done. You want binary compression? It's all there. Everything is included, warts and all. .NET Core, faster, leaner, all built for the modern standards. So the two platforms are actually quite different. Uh, the reason we cover that is that because Mono, as it covered, has a massive API surface. You can take a, any Windows um, .NET Framework application, and these days the odds are pretty good it'll just run on Mono. You want to use .NET Core, the new hotness, you're going to need the new hotness in code, because they're not the same by any means. So Mono is definitely alive and well. I could go into a lot more detail about where these two cover, but we do have fairly limited time, and I think we prefer to get to some of the demos. So we'll breeze through that one. Ooh, look at those pictures. Quality. So, building .NET apps for Linux essentially comes down to a very similar process as with any other language, and most importantly, a very similar process as you get with uh, building .NET apps for Windows. So to start with, you're going to need to prepare your environment. Preparing an environment for .NET is very similar to any other language. Oh, that's just perfect. Give me a second while I fix this up. Let's try this version. And... There we go, now we're talking. You're going to want an editor, and these are your main choices. You have on the left Visual Studio Code, on the right you have JetBrains Writer, and at the bottom there you have the venerable Mono Develop. Now Mono Develop is actually still being maintained and is still cracking along quite well. The other very contentious one, you have PowerShell. We have PowerShell on Linux now. So just in time to get Bash on Windows, we also have PowerShell on Linux. <laughs> There is, why those two turned up at the same time, we'll never know. But just in case you really, really like Windows Server administration, on CentOS, you now get PowerShell and Linux. <laughs> this is actually quite helpful because it means you'll clone a lot of .NET projects and they'll say, oh, to get started, just run this build.ps1 <laughs> file. And up until now, every Linux user looked at that and went, what is that? Now, thankfully, if you have PowerShell installed, you can actually run that PowerShell script and it'll probably break because Windows developers don't know how Linux works. <laughs> Now, the reason we cover Mono Develop especially is that obviously it's tied very closely to Mono and is the only one that supports the full Mono API surface. It also has the very fun trick where Microsoft um, a little while ago announced the, the shocking news that Visual Studio was coming for Mac. <laughs> 
I was like, oh my god, Visual Studio for Mac is amazing. All these Mac users installed Visual Studio for Mac. I went, oh my god, it's amazing. All Linux users going, wait a second. Visual Studio for Mac is literally monodevelop, repackaged with Mac skins. And the, the packaging is obviously very different, and the branding is all very different. Underneath, it's just monodevelop. Um, in fact, if you install an extension, it is installed as org.monodevelop. Because Visual Studio for Mac is literally just rebranded monodevelop. There are obviously a lot of finer points that are a bit different, but um, that's a bit beyond what we cover here. Now, there is also another option for preparing your .NET environment, which is very helpful if, like a lot of people today, I imagine will go, I wonder what this .NET thing's about, and then look at it and go, ooh, no thanks, which is to prepare your environment like an absolute technology hipster. Docker. <laughs> so Docker has the advantage that you can very quickly and easily spin up clean environments and uh, install just the tools you want without putting that mean, nasty Microsoft evilness on your PC. So what this means is you can also use, for example, that DMVM points out, you can quickly jump between different versions of the SDK. There's a lot of messiness about Microsoft's versioning, which is not going to be fixed anytime soon, but we'll breeze through that fairly quickly. Building your apps is pretty convenient. They have a nice new .NET CLI that lets you quickly and easily create applications. Here is the world's simplest when, um, web API project. We're adding a quick ORM in. And when we build and run, this is all being done from Bash, you will get a running application. It builds, it runs, you're good to go. You can also, if you're one of those boring people, do it with a UI. It's a very similar experience to that of Windows and has the very big advantage that VS Code on Windows is incredibly popular now, not just amongst .NET developers, but amongst most people. So the support for C Sharp in Visual Studio Code is excellent, as the name implies, and it does include a lot of very helpful extensions for people who are fairly new to the .NET platform. And does support debugging on .NET Core and on Mono, and can even do remote debugging on Linux systems, including, fairly recently, addition of Raspberry Pi support, which is pretty convenient. Testing, packaging, and bundling your app is, again, pretty similar to most languages. You have your selection of tools. So from the left, we have Cake, and then at the top, Saki, at the bottom, Fake, and then over here, we have AppVayer and Visual Studio Team Services, the most common um, selection. So Cake is all in C Sharp, Fake is all in F Sharp, and Saki is all in PowerShell. Um, AppVayer is a very good Windows CI platform. If you don't have any Windows boxes in your um, house, then you can easily spin up Windows machines and test out your CI and CD from there. Deployment of .NET Core applications. So the .NET Core has this very convenient design where the runtime and the SDK are completely separate components. You can install the SDK and build and deploy your app, and when you deploy it to your server, you only need to include the runtime. The runtime is smaller, lighter, has much shorter dependencies, and is very quick and easy to install, making it a lot easier to put just the runtime on app servers, for example, build locally with the SDK, publish, and deploy. There is also this very cool self-contained deploy self deployment, which requires only the dependencies of .NET Core, because it actually packages a complete copy of .NET Core inside. So to get a quick view of what that looks like, we can quickly spin up a new console application, and when we run it, we will see the very nice hello world, exactly what everyone wants. Now, if we do a quick build and publish, just a standard publish, we'll see that we get some DLLs in our app folder. And yes, these are DLLs on Fedora. The day has finally come. <laughs> now, what you still need to run that DLL is the actual .NET runtime. You need to have that installed. Now, obviously, that, not everyone's going to have that installed, which is why we also have the very cool ability to publish for a particular config. And you can publish using a specific runtime. What that will do is give you a monster set of files in that same folder, like I'm talking a lot of them. And what you've actually got there is a complete copy of the .NET Core runtime. The version is specifically bound to whatever you use to build your app. And if you have a look at the actual file, you get a compiled ELF executable that works on almost any 64-bit Linux distro that's supported, which is the vast majority of them these days. And if you quickly run that, hello world. Now, what that's actually doing is just a copy of the .NET runtime that is automatically being redirected to the same DLL as before. But that does mean that I can just copy, with rsync or anything else, the complete contents of that out folder. And on most, most Linux distributions, you can just run it straight as. And most importantly, if, the same, if you have all the dependencies, you can copy that same folder from a CentOS machine to a Fedora one, to an Ubuntu, to a Debian, anything else, and it will just keep running anywhere that the runtime is supported. Deployment and operations of particularly ASP.NET, which for those who don't know is the web server component, web framework component of .NET Core and includes its own core variant, um, has a built-in server called Kestrel. 
and it's designed specifically for simplified deployment, so each app uses its own server process that hosts the application. Um, and most importantly, it can actually, because it's an isolated process, be handled with systemd. Now, I'm not going to get into the, oh, should we use systemd debate, because that's going to take hours. But that is a very basic system file for how you can manage and run an ASP.NET app on a, any um, Linux distro that uses systemd. All you always have to do is copy that, copy your file, copy your application to where you want it, copy that into systemd, do a quick daemon reload, status, and you're good to go. Now, to delve more into the Linuxy bits, now that doesn't that picture trigger some people. Um, to get into the more Linuxy bits, .NET obviously was originally designed specifically for Windows. And over time, it slowly gained more support for other operating systems, but it still wasn't really perfect. Thankfully, with Core and with a lot of people like me who are suddenly going, this is pretty sweet, and then realizing that there's problems and going to Microsoft and saying, get your act together, there's been a lot of improvements over time and a lot of third-party contributions that make using .NET on Linux actually a lot nicer than it was when it first came out. So how can you, while .NET Framework includes a ton of APIs for handling Windows underlying system, its platform services, you can handle file systems, you can go mad, .NET Core takes a much more high level approach where you essentially can, you create your own connections to the underlying platform. One of the most helpful ones for .NET developers on Linux is a library by actually another Red Hatter named Thomas Tsane called tmds.dbus. What this allows you to do is gives you a complete managed code implementation where you can jump into C Sharp and control your system, issue messages, um, receive messages on dbus, which obviously works on any distro that uses dbus, which is a lot of them now. This is very, very helpful for inspecting and controlling the hardware, the operating system, and any services you're running. So if we quickly jump out and have a quick look at this one. So we have here an absolutely basic hello world. But what we can do is we can add in this package. So this csproj won't get into too much detail, but controls the third party libraries and a lot of the other details about your project. It's all mostly metadata. And you get this TMDS dbus. Now, this is mostly helpful because it does let you actually um, code gen out C Sharp implementations of specific Dbus APIs, which is pretty cool when you see it in use. So what we can do is these ones are prepared these earlier because it's a little easier than trying to do this completely fresh. Is so we should be able to list, oh, hang on, got that the wrong order. System bus services from our .NET CLI. Bang. That is all the dbus services running on my PC that I have access to. Now, I have had to make, it, make a couple of polkit changes because by default, the system bus is not readable to everyone. Um, but what we can quickly do is you can not just look, look at services, but you can list the objects of a particular service. So let's have a look at uPower. It's always a good one. Yeah. And it breaks. That's perfect. Thank you. There's your objects. So we can look at the individual objects listed on the dbus service for uPower. Now the reason we can have a look at that is that we can also do all of this from our actual application. So I can have a look at that and say, aha, what we've done now is used that dbus utility, which has a very good code gen capability, which is timely given the last talk, which will generate all the C sharp needed to contact the uPower dbus service. What that means is that I can quickly run this application and find out that I'm on battery, because I like to live dangerously during presentations. <laughs> Even better than that, if you want to get really serious, you can actually enumerate out all the details of all the objects on that bus and get a whole heap of information. So here we're pulling out battery capacities, for example. So let's have a look at this. Let's quickly run that one. And that is the, that's the sign of someone who likes to live dangerously. Two, two devices, both on battery. And I can pull all of that out just from C Sharp. So this is all happening on a Fedora 26 machine. Um, and is all capable through just one little third-party library and a bit of code gen. So it is quite capable of interacting with Dbus, and using Dbus, you can also actually interact with systemd, because it does expose its own Dbus API. You can use that same thing to control a lot of things. So if you're deploying production applications on Linux boxes, you can, look at, you can use Dbus, and obviously, like I mentioned, you do have to make some polkit changes, to look at the status of the server and adapt your application to the environment it's running in, which is very, very helpful. Now, that's to say there's still the slight problem where the .NET community is a bunch of Windows users. And we'll leave that judgment for another time. .NET includes this very cool thing called standard, which unfortunately I don't really have time to get into, but is an API specification. And things that run on standard will run on Linux and Windows and all sorts of things. And Windows users aren't too good at using that. So Windows users sit there and go, oh, well, pff, one runs on my machine. Look, I tried on Windows 7 and Windows 10, so it'll work on anything. 
And that's when you get people like me who go around on GitHub raising more issues than you've ever seen in your life, going, oh my god, why doesn't this work? Um, which also means you do need to test on multiple distributions. There is the fun one where, for example, when .NET Core first came out on Linux, it didn't support Fedora. What had actually happened was Microsoft came out and supported Linux, and what they meant was they supported Debian and Ubuntu, which is incredibly common in .NET circles. Logging. Logging's a big pain one because most Windows users will go, oh, cool, let's put it in the event log. You know what there's not on Linux? An event log. Same as you get people going, oh, I'll just put all these settings in the registry. That goes well. So there's a lot of cross-platform concerns like login, registry, app configuration, and the current environment that make it a bit tricky for Windows users to get used to the whole XPlat thing, which is why it's a good idea to have cross-platform CI/CD. And the reason I bring this up especially is because a lot of the Windows users out there are actually quite open to the idea of supporting Linux in their libraries and in their applications. The problem is most of them have never used it. Most of them are just as lost as you are, but in the opposite direction. Um, unfortunately, what that realistically means from our end is we've seen the light and they are stuck in the dark ages, which is a little unfortunate. But we can help them into the light. We can bring them to the wonderful world of Linux just slowly, because they're mostly used to Windows. And you'll get a lot of basic things, like path, uh, directory paths being wrong, and very basic things like registries and event logs. But thankfully, there's a lot of help out there. Microsoft, for once, have actually got really good documentation on this. They have cross-platform tests in place for diff different distributions, and the developers are always very, very open. All this is happening on GitHub. They have a ton of Gitter rooms. There's even some Slack rooms for specific um, areas of the platform, and they're all quite open to help from the community, which is very, very good. Now, to briefly summarize, and this is going to annoy some people, that image actually is mostly coming true. While it's most famous as the one behind Satya Nadella when he stood up and said, hey, you should give Microsoft all the money for Azure, it's actually quite famous for a lot of, a lot of quite applicable for a lot of Microsoft's platforms now, and especially .NET. .NET Core is not just open source, which we're all happy about, but runs on a lot of different platforms and includes a lot of capabilities specifically designed to make, give Linux users what they were looking for the whole time. Um, I would strongly imply anyone here who's sitting there thinking, oh God, not more Microsoft, I'm so sick of Microsoft, those evil, evil bastards, I believe in my one true God, Richard Storm, to give it a try, because Microsoft and the Linux platform have actually gotten on a lot better these days. And I can say, as someone who basically lives and breathes Linux and whose only developer development platform of choice is .NET, I have traditionally been somewhat shunned and in the dark. Thankfully, now we can stick to using the platform we want on using whatever platform we want with whatever language we want. Obviously, that was very fast because we were running very tight on time. Um, I'm happy to take questions now and or in the hallway, um, and you can find so, me online. So, unfortunately, lunch started seven minutes ago, which is, not, which is not your fault at all. <laughs> um, but I am aware that people like to not be kept from lunch. So, let's give Alistair a round of applause. Thank you.